Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Before we get started, I'm going to walk you through some of the engagement features available on our webinar platform. So we're live today, both from our CVent HQ studio and remotely from our home offices. And we have a bunch of speakers who would really love to engage with you. So to get us started, if you could all go to that top right chat area right now, I want you all to go there and let us know where you're tuning in from. Don't be shy. I know there's a bunch of you on right now. All right. Oh, all over the place. <laughs> all right, this looks like a lively audience. So I want you to use this chat feature to engage with other attendees. You can add your commentary here. You can um, put in information about your personal experiences based on what we're talking about. We also have a Q&A box right below there. That's where you want to put your questions for our panelists. So throughout the session, feel free to go to Q&A and add any questions you have for our speakers. We also have that uh, resources section and we're gonna put the deck there and any other relevant resources we have to this webinar. We won't have any polls today, so you won't have to use that area. And then at the end, feel free to take our survey. We love to improve our webinars for you, so let us know what you thought about the information we shared today. Also, after this session, you'll get the recording, so if you want to rewatch or share with colleagues, feel free. So with that little uh, housekeeping notes, I'm going to get started and introduce myself. I am Kelly Kopek. I'm a product, product marketer here at CVent. And what I work on are our exchange solutions. What that means is there are products that connect planners with suppliers. So think things like our venue sourcing solution, our new vendor sourcing solution. We recently acquired Reposit, which was very exciting. Event diagramming software, as well as room block management software. So I'm going to kick us off and I'm gonna bring on the rest of our speakers in a little bit. So let me set a little bit of context for today's content. At the beginning of the year, we showcased our top 10 trends predicted to impact events in 2024. We compiled these trends based on CVent data and uh, various market research uh, reports out there. And we did this at the end of 2023. But as we know, we're more than halfway through the year. We acknowledge that some of these trends are evolving as we see what's actually shaking out in 2024. So today we're going to highlight four of the trends that are our biggest movers and shakers and notable to pay attention to. So the first two that we're going to highlight are on this slide. First, technology unites planners and venues. Also, we're going to highlight venues and vendors support experience first events. Followed by centralization for scale. And finally, we'll talk about AI experimentation and how that's growing. So for each of these trends, I'm going to be showcasing relevant data on each of them, and we're going to have a discussion with our CVent panel of experts. And I'm going to bring them on right now to introduce themselves. And I will start with Carissa. Hi, Carissa. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Can you tell My us name a is bit? Go ahead. Go ahead. Take it away. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> it's like I'm ready yeah. for this day. Um, I'm Carissa Bartelt. I'm on the industry marketing team here at Cvent. So my job is really specializing in understanding and applying what's going on in our customers' worlds and in different industries in the market, and then understanding how we can impact, um, help, or address the needs and visions that they have for their marketing and events. Amazing. Thank you for joining us, Carissa. We also have McNeil coming to us from HQ. Hi, McNeil. Hello, hello. What's going on, Kelly? Uh, so yeah, McNeil Keenan, Vice President of Product Management here at Cvent. Been at Cvent the last 17 years, uh, so not quite the beginning, but uh, but pretty far back there in 2007. Uh, I head up product management along with uh, Brett Fitzgerald for the Event Cloud side of the house. So excited to, to join you guys today. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we're really excited also to have Alexa with us today. Alexa is joining us as a new member of CVent coming from our recent acquisition of Reposit. Alexa, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and Reposit? Absolutely. Really happy to be here. I'm Alexa Barabee. I'm one of the co-founders of Reposit, as Kelly said, CVent's most recent acquisition. So uh, super excited. We really specialize in vendor sourcing. And so 
um, think the the non hotel sector. So restaurants, transportation, AV, catering, logistics, decor, uh, you name it, we are here to help. Great, thank you. And last but not least, we have Alex joining us also from HQ. Hey, Alex. Product marketing. I've been here since 2008 uh, when I first started and we were looking to launch the supplier network. We've come a long way and I'm looking to share some of those trends with you today. Awesome. So we have a great lineup today and I'm going to kick it off with our first trend and we will bring on uh, the speakers in a little bit. So our first trend, technology unites planners and venues. We know event technology is key in uniting planners with venues and vendors, especially over the past few years. Both planners and venues have had to struggle with newer and fewer staff. We've all had to do more with less and technology has been more crucial than ever. So we wanna know how has this trend evolved? Are planners still newer and relying on technology? So we took a look at our data and our data is telling us, well, yes, that, that's still true. We looked at the evolution of new planners using our venue sourcing tool, the CVEN Supplier Network, and just over the course of 2024, we looked at this. And we saw that there was a significant 14% growth in new individual planner sourcing in just a really short time. That's Q2 over Q1. So this was significant across several industries, as you can see by the percentages below as well. We also took a look at some of the usage data from our technology that specializes in planner and supplier collaboration. So over the past 12 months, we saw more events being managed between planners and suppliers and more diagram exports and that facilitates collaboration happening in our event diagramming tool. Through our room block management software, Passkey, events and reservations, they're up nearly 11% over the last 12 months. So with collaboration through tech comes time savings and efficiencies. So it's clear both planners and suppliers are still relying on that more than ever to do their job. So that kind of tees up a little bit about this trend. And I want to bring in Alex and Alexa to join us to kind of dive into this trend a little bit more and get their thoughts. And so I want to bring Alex in first for the first question and ask about what hotels are thinking about the new planners in the industry. Um, this has been something that's been going on for quite a while. And as we saw by the percentages, it's still happening. We have a lot of new people that are joining events. Uh, how is this uh, impacting the hotels and what do they have to say? They're super positive with all the new faces entering the industry, of course, not just on the planner side, but also on the venue side. Um, and one thing that's really apparent is that education is key and it's a great opportunity for both the planners, the venues and the destinations to really build on that um, partnership. Um, so, one, you know, one thing, you know, a great opportunity for the, on the planner side is to really take the time to learn and understand how valuable partners um, these CVBs can do can be for you. And then on the venue side, sharing those best practices, the do's and don'ts, really informing these planners on what are the common turndown reasons for an RFP? Um, what, are, what are reasonable expectations when it comes to response times? And then the second piece is, you know, the relationship, uh, the industry is really built on relationships. And with that being said, an RFP can often feel very transactional. So just think of that RFP as oftentimes the gateway for really building that relationship in the future, even if you don't necessarily award that piece of business to a venue, there might be opportunity in the future. And then on the venue side, of course, if you don't win that piece of business, think about it as an opportunity to build that pipeline for the future. Absolutely. Relationships are, are key and we know that. And I think Alexa has a little bit of insight seeing kind of that in, uh, in real practice, see the, the planners and the vendors and the special event venues and that connection. And you're really seeing that play out throughout this year um, so let us know how, how you've seen that relationship evolve throughout the year. Yeah, I, I was uh, talking to a colleague earlier, but I feel like that's one of the most rewarding aspects about starting Reposit is just watching the relationships between planners and suppliers evolve over time. There's been so many instances over the past couple of years where we've seen a planner and a supplier connect for the first time through an RFP, but then end up working together on multiple events throughout the year. So um, we had a recent example 
of one of our planners. It's called Be New York, and he really specializes in bringing Belgian tourists to the U.S. And he was launching a new Sunday Harlem tour that involved seeing the neighborhood and, um, of course, the gospel and the famous Sunday brunch. And he was able to, through Reposit, connect with the Lido restaurant group. And since then, I've seen just multiple regular group brunches of 30, 40 people um, going to that same restaurant group over time. So I think it's things like that that are just really cool to see. And it all starts with an RFP, but it's what you do with it after. And so it's it's that being responsive, it's going the extra mile. I think she invited them on site to see it before they sent the group. So um, those relationships, I think, are what the business is all about. For sure. So it, the technology is really crucial in establishing the start of the relationship, but it, there's you know a lot that can happen outside of technology that can take that relationship even further. Do you have any examples um, of other ways that technology can help facilitate that relationship? Um, and we know that you know building that relationship happens, like we said, outside of technology. But there's also a lot that Reposit does specifically um, around creating a great relationship. Yeah, we we do a lot to bring our planner and supplier community together. Obviously, through the RFP and through the technology, we also have prospecting tools that we've built out for our vendor network. And so um, even if you have a week where you're not matched with an RFP, you have the ability to go into Reposit. You can say, you know, I'm looking for more DMCs. I'm looking for more corporate planners. I'm looking for more third parties. This is the average group size I like to support. And then you're able to, it's almost like a professional LinkedIn for the industry specifically. You're able to see the live planners on our network and connect that way. And then just like Suvent, we try to do a lot of like networking events to bring our, our bigger city communities together in person too, so they can build that trust off the bat. Amazing. What about you, Alex? What technology kind of stands out from the Cvent perspective as facilitating that relationship between planners and suppliers? Yeah, as I kind of touched on before, it you know when we think about the RFP itself, it, it's really that launch point to building those relationships. So on the planner side, it's a great opportunity to share, you know, what is your total event program? Where are you looking to host events, and how might you be able to bring business to that that venue or that destination? Um, and so just using that as that first touch point is a great way to really build that partnership over the long term. Great. And I am going to move on to our next topic, um, but we will get back to this crew in a little bit. So the next topic is specifically venue support experience first events. Planners, this is no surprise to anyone, are on the search for venues that can create the ultimate experience. And there's really a lot of pressure to have an attending experience that really outdoes other events that the community is attending or even outdo your own event each year. I know we try to do that every single year with our marquee conference, C-Event Connect, to do it bigger and better every single year. And that's why it's been more crucial than ever for venues to support these experience first events. Over the past few years, it's been a little bit harder because planners are struggling with high demand to find the right space and dates that they need. Um, so really looking outside of the traditional hotel is starting to trend. And so we wanted to look at some of our data to further explain that trend. And we of course have global hotels on our Cvent network, but we also have a vast database of unique venues like museums, stadiums, country clubs, and, and more. And we've seen a 16% increase in RFP value source to unique venues in the last 12 months. And planners are looking at their options because RFPs that contain traditional venues, such as hotels, they also had unique venues copied 6% of the time. Another, another trend we've noticed is around the use of CVBs. Planners are copying CVBs, uh, for example, a, a Visit San Antonio, who I know we used at our, at our CVent Connect conference. They're copying CVBs on 48% of all RFPs globally. This is over the last 12 months. When we looked at that value metric of these RFPs, we found that the RFPs that copied CVBs, they're amounting to 58% of that total RFP value. So this shows us that CVBs are most valuable on those large RFPs. Now, I wanna bring on our panelists again, specifically Carissa and Alexa, uh, and, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna start with Carissa, and I, I wanna ask you um, a little bit more about 
what planners are really looking for when they're seeking a venue to create that ultimate attendee experience. Yeah, I think, you know, first, when we talk about experience at an event, right, experience tends to be a jargon word we use a lot. Um, what we're really getting at is, I think, the unique feel that sets your event apart, right? Or it's essentially kind of like your brand in action. So what do vendors need to bring to the table to kind of help with that? I think um, customization and flexibility they should be asking themselves always, right? How adaptable can we be? Do we have the flexibility to create different activity zones, lounges? I wanna create different experiences um, throughout the day, right? To accommodate different vibes or different activities. I think, you know, oftentimes a blank canvas venue always gives us room to customize, but not every planner or organization has the budget or resources to really start from scratch. So. What are your options? Do you have brandable areas or items that you really offer out of the box? Lighting, uh, screens, anything that I can use to kind of show and set my brand or my experience, right? And I think venues need to help figure out what their experience is, their individual location, and then market themselves as a destination. If there's something um, that really helps them stand out and there's a feeling that's associated with the space. It's already one step up for event teams, right? One thing off their list. It's easier to motivate people to register and attend. I think um, we did an event at in San Antonio at Connect at the ESPY, right? Which is an iconic location and people that go to San Antonio want to visit the ESPY and that really helps then drive the, the attendance to that particular thing because your audience already wants to attend above and beyond just you know, because we've invited them. For sure. And I know you, t you attend a lot of events too, and you are definitely getting a lot of ideas and inspiration from um, other key players in, in the events industry and in the marketing industry and in the tech industry. So what have you seen in any of those events that you attended that really stood out to you as being um, super unique to that venue and creating a really great experience? Yeah, uh, I think one of my favorite examples is Sixth Sense. They always do a great job of really leaning into kind of the local destination vibe wherever they're hosting their events, right? Um, they had this entire event space that they rented out, which was already this big, beautiful venue, right? But they added their own kind of personal and brand touch by setting up, you know, an area for presentations and networking and lounges. And they leaned into kind of the destination feel and the feel of that beautiful space by just accentuating it with their brand elements like beautiful floral arrangements and stuff like that. And it was it was just gorgeous. And it felt very much like somewhere I wanted to be and very much like attendees wanted to stay because they focus so much on the experience and the feel of the space and then these different activities and activations throughout. People were coming and they weren't just coming to try to check the box and do the one thing. They found themselves lingering and staying and sitting in the lounge and doing the leather branding activation and having the cocktail and watching the presentation because they didn't want to leave. And I think that makes such a huge difference when you're investing, you know, time and energy to plan it that you want to keep people engaged in your experience the whole time. So if people want to stay, that's huge. And I think creating that experience, it really ties back to that last trend we were talking about, because I, I, I'm sure the ideas were coming from, in this case, like Sixth Sense, right? Their planning team, but the hotel and, and the venues have to be willing to accommodate and really be creative in making this, this idea come to life. So it's all about that collaboration. Um, so I think, I think these two trends really tie together really nicely. I want to ask Alexa um, specifically, why do you think that unique venues um, are trending right now, maybe over a traditional hotel? Um, why, why is this happening right now? Yeah, it's funny. We've seen the same trend in Reposit's RFP data recently, too. And I think from my perspective, there's a couple different reasons. Um, one, I think they're really looking to personalize and customize. And I think oftentimes unique venues just offer a bit more flexibility to create those tailored experience that are aligning with their vision versus maybe a traditional host hotel, hotel space. And so um, maybe the ability to bring in different catering options or different decor or have more flexible layout configurations, things like that, I think play a big role. And then in this day and age, I never know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but social media is always part of the conversation. So I think everyone really wants that like Instagrammable moment. 
and the unique venues can provide kind of more visually appealing backdrops that get the attention and really get that engagement up. And then I'd probably say the last big thing we see a lot of is just taking environmental considerations into play. Um, and a lot of the times we're seeing unique venues may have a smaller environmental footprint compared to a very large hotel and are just aligning a bit more with the sustainability efforts that the planners are putting forward. Um, going off of that, you mentioned sustainability, environmentally friendly being a special consideration for planners. Is there anything yeah. else that they're seeking out specifically with unique ven ven venues? And what are the yeah. types, I guess, that you see popular? We've seen a lot of um, a lot of venues that involve some kind of activity being really popular, and it's not traditional meeting space. Like I would even say, before we worked super closely with Top Golf, I didn't know that they had private meeting space. I've always gone to like you know hit the ball and drink with my friends. So um, things like that. We've seen like Top Golf, Pinstripes, uh, Flight Club, even City Experiences, just really nice like dining cruises. Um, concert venues and music venues we've seen be pretty popular for, for meeting space, outdoor vineyards, cool wineries, wine bars, museums, things like that I think we've seen as like a, a really big rise. And then probably restaurants too, just like using the private dining space as a meeting room and then going out and having some kind of cool activation. We've seen like mezcal tasting or oyster shucking classes. So um, kind of combining that like immersive experience with the venue space has been very popular. Amazing. That that sounds like a lot of fun, a lot of good ideas for anyone playing an event right now. Um, I'm going to move us on to our next topic, keeping us on track. Uh, our next topic is all about centralization. And that's uh, a trend that we at CVent have uh, seen with our customers become increasingly needed. Most organizations are concerned with costs and efficiencies of their teams and centralizing the event teams and processes can really help them achieve both. And I wanna showcase our trend data right now. Um, and, and this is coming from C events data. With remote work prevalent and small meetings crucial to doing business, we've noticed that there's a shift to more small meetings, RFPs being managed on C event. We saw that 38% of RFPs sourced in the last 12 months were considered small meetings RFPs. So why do you think this matters? Why with companies doing more simple meetings? I think it matters because typically small meetings like internal board meetings, lunch and learns and team retreats, that type of thing, they aren't necessarily handled by that central meetings team. So the management, the spend, the performance of these small meetings, it, it may go untracked. Um, it may be handled outside of policy and process. So that's why it's really important to focus on centralization as a as a strategy. So I want to look at this commission study that we did with Forrester last year on scaling event programs. You can see that field teams are handling simple in-person events 75% of the time. They're even executing 34% of large in-person events. So the frequency and complexity of in-person events, even those simple meetings, it's super high. Field teams need to use standardized processes and technology to create consistency and centralization. And then finally, our last piece of data, uh, we see that organizations are trending towards building a center of excellence, where a highly skilled team has centralized best practices, processes, and technology. 65% of organizers, according to the Forcer Report, already have a center of excellence or plan to do this in the next 12 months. So this is really trending right now um, across organizations. And I'm going to bring in some of our panelists. Uh, Carissa is going to join us again, and then Alex and McNeil in the studio. And I'm going to start with you, Carissa. I'm going to ask you, um, you know, what types of events could be handled by a field team? And, and what do you think are the major impacts of perhaps uh, that process being decentralized? You know, I mean, well, let's start with that. I think field teams can be a number of different things. They can be local teams. They can be kind of regional teams. They can be kind of SWAT teams or teams working on um, higher touch kind of activations that you're doing or different campaigns. Um, so like user groups is a great example. Customer events are a great example. Sometimes these live outside the core event teams, right? Customer marketing maybe is putting them on maybe in conjunction with your product marketing teams. There's 
sales dinners and VIP prospect events that happen really all the time without involvement or just knowledge from marketing and event teams, which means that that part of the customer journey is not being tracked. So if we're not seeing the data, then on the true journey down the funnel, like how do I know what is helping my prospects or my customers progress? I don't know where to invest or what truly led to conversion. And I think one of the biggest versions of um, field events oftentimes are events that you're attending or that you're sending people to in some fashion. Um, maybe you're going to exhibit at an industry show, right? That doesn't require the typical event planning process, right? But you're sending people there to connect and generate leads. And sometimes there's supplemental activations that I'm planning or that I'm doing, right? And I want to be able to track and report on and follow up on all that stuff in a really consistent way so that any way, any lead, I can activate the right process internally and really nurture those new connections. If all of this is happening kind of in different systems and all of these events are kind of sporadic, right, with different processes, how can I truly be effective? If I can't see all that data, it's not centralized in one place, how can I really measure apples to apples, for lack of a better phrase, or improve and decide upon what's working, uh, where to lean in or where to cut back, especially when I think we're all being asked to, you know, focus on ROI and cost and make some cuts. So without having that central and complete view of really your event channel and customer journey, you really just cannot make the best decisions. Yeah, I agree. Those are some really good points and examples. And I'm, I'm curious, it, do you think that this idea of a center of excellence, does that apply only to maybe larger enterprise organizations who um, are doing events all over the world and have a large team uh, versus a, a smaller, you know, mid-market uh, organization that maybe has a, a smaller events team? Do you think that, um, that it can apply to all or what are your feelings? Yeah, I mean, uh, the concept of center, center of excellence, right, is just making sure that you are aligned on, you know, the process and you're putting together some sort of kind of guardrails for executing something. So for events, that could mean uh, branding, budgets, vendors, right, the look and feel so that every event kind of happening feels like it's a part of the same family, right? Um, this also comes with like data security. We need to make sure they're all being handled the same way. And, you know, on a global scale, if you're a bigger organization, yeah, that means you have teams everywhere doing that. But on a smaller scale, right, it's even more important to be aligned and to be efficient and to have everybody really empowered to make decisions and activate, but within their lane, right? So when you have a center of excellence and people come together to set the tech the processes and have the right people involved then even smaller teams are being more you know efficient with their time and being able to be more creative because they have kind of that process and that kind of path outlined for them everybody's swimming in the right direction exactly and i know we have some hotels and and venues and unique venues and cvbs joining us so i don't want to leave um that perspective out of it um, so I want to ask Alex, um, because, uh, you know, this topic may not seem that relevant to that audience, but it actually is because it's really important for, again, I'm going to bring up relationships again, but like fostering that relationship between the planner and supplier, having that central point of contact and understanding if the MSAs, the contracts, everything's going to be consistent um, through that interaction. So I, I want to ask you, um, how important do you think this is? Uh, centralization of the the planner organization to the hotels. Yeah, I think it's it's obviously huge on the venue side. Um, having those negotiated rates, having those preferred um, partners, really helps with the efficiency. Um, sometimes a planner has thirty days from the time the event is approved to the time the event is actually happening. And you know, without those sort of relationships already built, those processes in place, those rates approved. That can obviously be very time constraining for both the venue and for the planner as well. And then when you have those opportunities to um, have those preferred relationships with those rates negotiated, it allows the venue to spend more time planning and, and trying to um, attract some of those larger meetings and events, which take more time, obviously. So centralization is key. I think having that go-to person or people on the planning team is obviously extremely helpful on the venue side. <laughs> uh, th thank you for that. I, I don't want to leave out the technology side and I want to give McNeil his his time to shine. So I'm going to ask 
McNeil, um, where should an organization start when they're looking to centralize their event tech? Yeah, it's good. It's a good question. So I didn't, I didn't leave everyone. I'm still here. Um, so, you know, when we were thinking about all our conversations with our customers at Cvent Connect, one of the key takeaways that I had walking away from San Antonio was just how many organizations were trying to get their head around their tier three events. And, you know, the problems they were trying to solve were a lot of the things that Carissa had just talked about. They needed more visibility into the program. They needed more consistency in execution. It just felt like hurting the cats. Nothing was being done in a consistent way. And they needed better data flow because ultimately they had to prove impact for their event. So a lot of these things have been known for a long time. So what have been the problems to, to really getting there? Well, one of the things is maybe you don't have enough C-Vent experts and you're worried about letting non-experts get into the platform, for example. Um, you might have concerns around adoption and compliance. Um, how do I get more people using the same platform and, 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 and uh, following the same playbooks? So you know, those are some of the things that, that we see, but I think maybe the, the number one example from a problem perspective is putting more events on CVent or centralizing the program, putting more events on the center of excellence, many times means more work for me, more work for my team and my team's at capacity. And so really the answer we heard is I'm trying to get my head around tier three, but I know that I can only do it if I can allow for self-service. And so what does self-service really look like? Um, you know, one of our customers stated it pretty well. They said their strategy was centrally owned, but locally operated. And so that really kind of hits well at that self-service idea. And so you've got to be able to build your playbook. And Krista talked about this as well. So what does a playbook look like? It looks like brand guidelines. It looks like image libraries. It looks like definitions of tone and voice and email templates. So you're all singing from the same playbook. It's also guardrails. You can't veer outside of this when it comes to data privacy or data collection. You always have to collect this information. And so really that starts to get into more than just the playbook. It's building out your templates so that everyone kind of has that uh, rinse and repeat, that they're able to get started. They're 90% of the way there when they're managing all of this on their own. Um, so I really, uh, I think that's kind of the, the steps to get to centralizing the program. It's empowering self-service. And I think you mentioned, you know, it, it takes a lot of work to do all of this, but the, the pay is, is really great. And I think that, um, you know, maybe some of our customers are realizing it, it, it doesn't take as long as one would imagine. So, I mean, do you, where, where do you, if someone is looking to start um, doing this, how long do you think this would take them to maybe implement a, a self-service kind of uh, uh, playbook? Yeah, look, it's not all or nothing, right? So it can yeah. be done in a very iterative basis. So you choose, you know, which pieces you want to pull off to get started. You might say, hey, the most important thing to me right now is visibility and consistent data collection. So my main goal is to make sure that we capture the same information in our feedback surveys and in our registration forms and in our live polls, uh, you know, in the room, whatever it might be. You might say, no, brand consistency is the number one thing. We're all over the map. Everyone's creating their own brand, their own look and feel. Um, and, and I need to make sure that I develop my brand guidelines so that everyone's going to follow the exact same thing. So webinars like this have the right blue background um, to the live display on site at my, at my luncheons has the same color blue. Um, so it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You don't need all your ducks in a row across 16 different variables to get started. Uh, so I really think it's, you know, where do you want to swarm on your first one to three things each quarter and then get the program richer and, and deeper over time. Great. Well, thank you. I'm going to move on to our final topic and the topic where we probably could spend the most amount of time. And lucky for us, we have a decent amount of time to spend on this topic. But let's talk about AI. Uh, and most organizations are relying on some form of artificial intelligence to execute events. And this is always evolving, which I think we all know. Um, so in a short time, a lot can change. It's clear that AI is here to stay though, and I wanted to show this example um, from an Accenture report. 98% of global executives agree that AI will play an important role in the organization in the next three to five years. While productivity and streamlining job processes, they're the top reasons why um, executives think that AI will play a role, 54% also believe that AI can improve written content. 
And um, I'm going to bring on McNeil and Alexa. They're our resident AI experts uh, to talk about um, a little bit more about our experiences and how we're using AI. And McNeil, I'll start with you. And I, I'm curious, what are the tangible ways that planners and suppliers can use AI now to support their events? Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll talk about the planner side and leave the supplier side to, to Alexa. But, um, you know, when we think about what, a, what AI is, AI has been around for a long time, but what's really new about AI is the, the generative AI, these large language models. And largely what it means is, you know, they've studied the, the entirety of things that have been written in the, in the English or many different languages. And so what are the things that it's best for? Well, first and foremost, some of the, the most hidden work for a planner is the content. There is so much content you have to produce for your events, whether it's website copy, 100 emails that you're sending to all different segments of your attendee audience, your, your push notifications, and then let's not forget your FAQs, your internal stakeholder documentation, your exhibitor documentation, your speaker documentation. It is endless. And so you can get started now by making sure you're building a centralized knowledge base of your whole event, and then you can start to automate the creation of that content once you built a really great, well-defined knowledge base, think of it as like a, a large wiki or a, a large FAQ. And then you can use AI to help you write session descriptions, help you write the know before you go emails, help you write um, uh, all your stakeholder communications that you need so everybody knows what they need to know and not be spending days, weeks, months creating that kind of content. And uh, Alexa, because uh, McNeil is so graciously uh, putting the ball in your court for the supplier side, what are some ways that suppliers are using AI right now? So we've seen a lot of people using it in terms of like reading contracts, I think, on the supplier side. Again, I always say AI should not replace your lawyers, but it, can, it does a great job at summarizing documents, especially if you have the upgraded version of ChatGPT. Um, so you can ask it things like, hey, pull out the most important um, phrases in this contract. Tell me what is maybe more favorable to the person who wrote it. Tell me what the most expensive um, room block night is in this contract, anything like that. Um, it essentially reads it and, and can answer any of that back to you. And then I think another big thing on the supplier side is just like sales and prospecting in general. So using AI to find what your competitors could be doing, finding good target clients for yourself, um, and just speeding up that process in general. Absolutely. And in a little bit, I'm, I'm going to ask you a little bit about specifically what Reposit is doing. So we'll get into that a little bit too. Um, McNeil, you mentioned some of the ways AI can help a team be more efficient. And I know CBEN is doing a lot of that. So I'm wondering what specifically uh, the CBEN team is, is using AI for to support our event program. Yeah, sure. So I'll speak uh, a little bit on behalf of my wife who heads up the event technology group for the Cvent team. Um, uh, you know, they always say stay close to your users. I happen to marry our, our most expert user. user. Uh, so, you know, when I talk to them about how they're already using AI, they're using it in a number of ways and they feel like they're just getting started. Um, so it starts with brainstorming ideas and themes and topics and unique types of um, activations that you can do. I mean, it really is like, you know, having a peer sitting right next to you where you can have AI act as you know, a creative event designer um, or a logistics uh, partner. And so it starts with the brainstorming. Then it gets into the content like I was talking about earlier. So, so creating all of that content from that centralized knowledge base. Then it gets into the data. So what's happening with my event? There's so much time being spent post event, building out stakeholder summaries, preparing for debrief meetings, what happened in the keynote session, what happened in our morning breakouts, what happened uh, in the, the partner track or the executive track? Well, a lot of that means I'm exporting survey responses, I'm reading rows and rows of data, I'm trying to summarize the positive comments and the negative comments, all that can be done with AI. And then the last piece that, that I know they're using extensively, and you actually will see this uh, you know, on our own website, is to be able to repurpose our content from events like Connect, where we record all of our sessions, to webinars like this one. Uh, they're using AI to automatically generate uh, short clips that you can share on social media. They're using AI to generate chapters to make the videos more engaging, to generate subtitles and captions. Um, so that's been a really popular tool, and it makes the turnaround time that much faster. It went from weeks 
to hours to start to repurpose content from events just like this one. Um, and AI is at, at the core of that. Yeah, those are some really great examples. I also want to talk about our platform because that is something that I know McNeil and Alexa with Reposit, that's something that we're heavily focused on, making um, sure our users have uh, access to AI in all of the places where it makes sense. So Alexa, I'm going to go to you. I know you have some really great examples of what Reposit has done and what you're doing to uh, incorporate AI into your platform. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Cool. Yeah, there's um, three main areas in the platform where we rely really heavily on AI. So um, the first is the core of our product, which is the RFP matching process. And so when a planner creates an RFP in Reposit, there's just so much happening in the background to make sure that you get the best possible matches to meet your needs or your clients' needs. So we're integrating machine learning and expert systems, which are two major AI categories. As McNeil mentioned, AI has been around for a while. It didn't just hit the map when ChatGPT was launched. Um, these systems have been around for a really long time. But anyways, with the machine learning, um, what it's doing is it's scanning all the data points on the planner's RFP, and it's matching them with the best fit suppliers from our very large network. And then as a planner is interacting with supplier quotes, it's almost like a, I say it's like a dating app turnstile, but you can essentially like swipe left or swipe right on the vendors that you really like. You can mark them as under consideration. You can accept quotes, you can decline them. And the algorithm is learning your preferences over time. And so um, to make it maybe a little bit more tangible, if there's any big Netflix fans in the room, I know I watch way too much of it, or Spotify fans, it's like the top recommended shows for you or Spotify's Discover Weekly. The more you use the platform, um, the more the AI becomes personalized and smarter over time. So that's built within our core product. And then we launched in September our first chat GPT integration within our proposal builder. And so as you're communicating back and forth with the various vendors, instead of needing to download all of that information out and copy and paste and put it into a PowerPoint in order to ship it off to your client, um, you can click a button that says add to proposal. ChatGPT will summarize the back and forth between you and the vendor. It'll pull in all the information from their profile too, and it will summarize it into a nice little paragraph that you can ship off to your clients with images and kind of everything packaged up nicely. So what used to take a lot of time now can be done in just a matter of minutes, which is pretty cool to see. And then our last one, which is very recent, I think we launched it less than a month ago at this point, but we've been working on it for a while. Um, that one's using natural language processing. It's called Plan Pilot. And so you almost have, I like to think of it as you have like a little virtual assistant with you at all times, or maybe an intern, um, if any of you have used that. But basically the goal of that feature is to eliminate all of the back and forth communication that needs to happen between planners and vendors during the pre-planning process. And so I say this all the time and I love our suppliers to death. There's no hard feelings, but sometimes they're moving too quick. They got a lot on their plate and they don't read every single piece of the RFP. And so what Plan Pilot will do is it will prompt the vendor to get those responses back. Let's say they mix, missed adding tax to the quote or they missed gratuity or they forgot to upload their menu. Um, it will swoop in and it really speeds up that time to booking too. So that one really good results so far, but we're going to keep working on it and we're really excited about it. Amazing. Uh, and I'm going to go to McNeil about the, the C-Vent event platform. Um, I just want to let you know, you only have a couple of minutes because we're doing a lot. Oh, so you can probably talk minutes. a lot about this. So <laughs> uh, what are, what are you most excited about that we've done or are doing? Yeah. So like, I think there's, there's three buckets. One is getting friction out of the marketplace. And Alexa talked about that, you know, when it came to vendors, we're doing the same thing with the venues um, in that we want to help planners, um, you know, spend less time with RFPs, but providing more relevant information. So they get better responses. And we want to help venues have faster responses. So many of the content is, is embedded deep inside their, their custom live question libraries and their responses, because many of the responses are the same but it takes time to pull it all together. So we wanna get friction out of that process so we can get better RFPs out, better responses uh, back and faster. Um, and so really getting friction out of the marketplace. And that was some of the real magic that we saw in Reposit, um, specifically in the vendor side. And so we definitely see the same opportunities when it comes to, to the um, sourcing side. Now there's two other sides to this as well. One is planner efficiency writ large. And the second is personalizing the attendee experience. 
on the planner efficiency side, it's all about saving time. So we're doing things like writing assistance. We're doing things like um, adding in AI assistance onto all of our insights dashboards. So you're not just you know, extracting data and viewing uh, visuals. You can simply ask a question, get an answer. But one of the things that we're most excited about is personalizing the attendee experience. Um, you know, if you think about what really drives engagement and impact for an event, it's, it's making every experience feel like it's bespoke to each individual. And AI is really an enabling technology that can get us there. And, that, and that's in a lot of ways. It helps our planners better understand each and every contact in their address books interest using AI based on all their engagement at their events. Then you can use segmentation to really personalize every part of the attendee experience and target your functionality specifically to each different segment of your audience. But it's not gonna st uh, stop there. Things like chatbots on your website to answer questions and hopefully convince people to sign up for the event. When they sign up for the event, we're gonna help them onboard writing great profiles. We're gonna have, give them great headlines and great descriptions so more people have complete profiles. But then it gets really excited when we get into the engagement of the event. We wanna make sure that their experience feels built for them. And it's all in this area called my event. That's where they're gonna to go to see daily summaries of everything they did for that day. They're gonna be able to actually see key takeaways from the sessions they went to. Well, how's that? Well, we're able to actually tap into the soundboard of every session in every room, and we'll be able to use AI to transcribe, write key takeaways, quotes, key ideas. So it's like every attendee in the room is taking notes but now they don't have to. And so we're able to kind of put that all together. Here's the people you met. Here's the exhibitors that, that you uh, went to or booths that you visited. Here's the sessions that you went to and the key takeaways. And we're writing that daily summary. We're writing that event summary. So no, no, not a single one of your attendees is gonna forget the value that they got at this event. It's almost like the boss email. You know, you write that email template before the event. Hey, download this, send it to your boss so you can convince them to go to the event. Well, this is happening after the event. Now they can, have all the key takeaways in one place. They're gonna remember the value they got. They can share those takeaways to their colleagues and they can prove the value to their boss uh, that it was worth sending you to that event. And not only should you send me back next year, but you should send me and a few more of my colleagues. Um, and that's all kind of because of this new enabling technology to really kind of personalize each experience without a planner having to write these things one by one, which of course, nobody has time to do that. So it sounds like through what we talked about with the venues and vendors supporting events and then with AI and all of the great things that that's going to do, not only from the planning process, but the attendee experience, that events are just going to get that much better in, in 2025. So I'm going to uh, kind of use that as a segue into our final topic because we are currently now working on what are those trends going to be for 2025? I'm gonna use this panel to ask our panelists so what they think um, is going to make the 2025 trend list. So it, um, everyone can, can join and, and give their perspective. Um, and I'll, I'll start with Carissa because we haven't heard from you in a while. Do you wanna start and kick us off? Sure, uh, I think I'm gonna go with like a two part goal for next year. I think my first part is going to be one more events. Um, I think they're not necessarily net new events, but like McNeil talked about earlier, trying to get your arms around those like tier threes and those other events that might be happening outside of um, your purview that now all of a sudden they're coming to light, right? So I think we're going to see different types of events, more formats of events, um, different purposes of events. So that leads me into the second kind of trend is with more events, um, maybe on your roadmap or on your plate, right? What is what is the goal? So and a, a huge focus on data and KPIs. What's the purpose? How do I measure it? How do I track it? Is it serving that? Because not every event is just about pipeline and lead gen, right? And those are the buzzy ones, right? But is this a customer event? Is this about retention? What are the metrics that I should be looking at to make sure that that event design is really serving the goal and the purpose of the event as a whole? And I think there's gonna be such a focus on how to one, understand the vision, design, and then report on what the true intention of the events that we're hosting um, are. Great, thank you, Carissa. Moving on to you, Alex. Yeah, so I think on um, from the from the planner perspective, I think it's going to be that trend that you know on the venue side they must adapt this technology um, with the budgets and you know continuously under pressure 
these planners don't necessarily have the ability to do all the site visits that they once were able to do. So venues really need to adopt that technology to showcase their space digitally. Um, so that I think is the first one that planners are really going to expect to see that more and more um, in the coming year. And the second one is just that heightened importance of privacy and security. Um, so currently in today's world, oftentimes with rooming lists, information is shared over email. There's a lot of sensitive data in that um, in those communications. And so I think you know, more and more planners are going to expect and rely on that to be transferred securely um, through room block management tools. Great. Alexa, I am going to you. And I, I think we know AI is going to make the list. This is something different. <laughs> yeah, I can leave AI out of this one. Um, I have two quick ones. One, I think what we've seen a lot of over the past year is uh, third party planners who traditionally only focused on site selection, um, really expanding their offerings to their clients beyond just the hotel room blocks and meeting space. And so I think that will continue to grow over time. I think it puts those planners in a more valuable position with their clients to truly be able to do that one-stop shop. And I, I think Reposit is doing a good job of making that a whole lot easier for them. And then the second one, we touched on it a little bit when we talked about the unique venues, but. I think in addition to the venues, we'll see a lot more like pop-up activations or on-site personalized gifting, just again, to contribute to making an event feel really unique and stand out um, and memorable for all the guests. I love that. And then finally, McNeil, uh, what trends do you predict? Well, I definitely get to talk about AI if no one else did. <laughs> um, so so I, I think what we're going to see is, is the move from kind of these generic uh, kind of chat GPT like, like tools and then getting more purpose built. And so I don't think this is going to be a super unique insight, but I'll try and give more color to it. And it looks like the world of AI agents. So just like you would onboard a new employee, you're going to onboard a new AI agent to take on very specific tasks for you. So instead of just working generically with AI to write session summaries or to write um, attendee facing FAQs or uh, to build you know, key takeaways from your videos, you can start to build custom GPTs or AI assistants or agents, all the same, same kind of thing, uh, so that they have purpose-built tasks where they're great at it. So just like you're onboarding, you're going to write documentation for them. You're going to write templates. You're going to write style guides. You're going to give them access to existing work you've already done in the past. And so then you can go to each agent and they can get the job done with much more higher fidelity. So what that's going to mean for you is it's going to be really important for you to kind of build a, a culture of writing within your own organization to make sure everything is very, very well documented so that then these agents can go and take on their task and be much more successful in those outcomes. And so you'll kind of have this army of purpose-built agents to help you execute your event. Great. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Really great perspectives. I think, um, I have a lot of help in starting the process of 2025 event trends. So really excited to see um, when we kick off that campaign. Uh, hopefully this audience can tune in to learn a little bit more about what we're predicting for 2025. Uh, now I'm going to transition us into our live Q&A section. We have a couple of minutes left. I saw a couple of questions come in. And I did want to mention um, before we do that, that uh, we have a, an offer for a uh, $100 Amazon gift card for attending a demo with us. So there's going to be a form in the chat. You can click on that link. And um, if you do a demo with us, you'll get that $100 gift card. All right. So now into our questions. And it's not too late. If you have a question, put it in right now. Put it in the Q&A box. We still have a couple of minutes until the top of the hour so we can answer those questions. Uh, first one, it looks like it comes from Giselle, uh, and this is on um, Center of Excellence. So I, I imagine, Carissa, and, and maybe McNeil, you could chime in a little bit too. Um, uh, you could answer this one. What are some ways we can integrate field teams into a Center of Excellence while minimizing new technology barriers? Ooh, I'll take it. I love, and I think this is this is the question of how do I make this happen, right? I think. Um, keeping things really simple and supportive, you know, training, um, best practices, templates, all that stuff kind of work on the front end will help them adopt the tech of the process easier, um, roll it out in stages so it's not super overwhelming right away, and then keeping open lines of feedback, right? Give them one point of contact. So I'm going to go through two for 
uh, questions might seem like more work for that one person, but it allows you to really then control uh, the adoption and act on the feedback quickly if it's going through one person or one team. Um, but mainly I think find the right tech, whatever that tech is so that it can scale up and down for the people that need to get in and do the nitty gritty programming or have kind of all that access. And then the tech that can scale so it's easier, right? They're only seeing the things and needing to access the parts of that tool that they really need to accomplish their job. So the process of the rollout being there, being supported, but also the right tool to really make that happen company wide. Yeah, and I think um, just to add on super briefly, I think it really just boils down to the, the mentality that you have. If you're going to be successful, what's your the, the, the collaboration kind of culture you need to build is you are enabling others versus you're uh, having them comply. And if it, if it takes on that kind of metrics of com or that that idea of or tone of compliance, there's going to be a lot of resistance. Right. And but if it is, hey, I'm enabling you, I'm helping you, I'm giving you new tools so that you your events can be more impactful. You know, that's going to be the basis of a more successful relationship. Great. On a, a similar note, we have a question from Manish on um, Center of Excellence as well. Do we also have access to detailed reporting view or dashboards in Center of Excellence program? So maybe looking for like a, an example or any kind of um, metrics around a program. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, Carissa or McNeil, if you have an answer to this. Yeah, I mean, I think that where it starts is defining your metrics, right? How do you define success? Um, well, certainly, we you know, on the Cement platform, we have lots of data, and and, and I don't think it's a, a lack of data that's the problem. It's understanding what are the key metrics that you're trying to measure and that you're trying to move. Um, so you might have your your key performance indicators. But it might not be a goal to, to move satisfaction right now, but we want to move impact or, or we want to get more efficient in delivery, whatever it may be. So um, it starts with defining your metrics and then defining your objectives for that given quarter or year. What metrics are you trying to move? Are you trying to move satisfaction? Are you trying to move impact? Are you trying to move consistent execution? Um, and so it's not going to be for a lack of data. It's going to be more of you defining what determines success and then building out those dashboards from there. And right on time, we just hit 11 o'clock uh, Eastern time. So I think that will wrap us up today. Of course, if you want to provide any feedback or you have additional questions you didn't get to, a chance to ask today, take our survey and we'll check those out after the webinar. But thanks again to our panel of speakers. And thanks to you all for attending. And we'll see you next time.